Hello, I'm Dr. Marla Shapiro, and I sit on the board of trustees of the International Menopause Society. And today we're joined by Dr. Jan Schifrin from Harvard. Jan, will you introduce yourself to our audience? Of course. So first, Marla, it's an absolute pleasure to be here and really want to thank the AMS. Uh, yeah, I really want to thank the IMS for the um, opportunity to be part of this interview series. So I'm Dr. Jan Schifrin. I'm a reproductive endocrinologist and OBGYN at the Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston. I'm the Vincent Trustees Professor of Obstetrics, Gynecology, and Reproductive Biology at Harvard Medical School. And at the MGH, I direct our Midlife Women's Health Center. Okay, so today we're going to be talking about a little bit of alphabet soup. We're going to be talking about GSM, and let's first start out with what GSM stands for and why the movement from VVA, which is the phrase we used for the longest time, and where VVA fits in the continuum of GSM. Great question. So the genital urinary syndrome of menopause essentially describes changes to the vagina, vulva, urethra, and bladder, all of which are secondary to menopausal estrogen deficiency. So the symptoms could be genital, you know, dryness, burning, irritation. There are sexual symptoms, typically a diminished lubrication, pain with sexual activity. The urinary uh, symptoms can include urgency, dysuria, and recurrent UTIs. And most importantly, all of that encompasses vulvovaginal atrophy. So we are not um, getting rid of that term. It's still important, but it's really just a part of the syndrome. Uh, and the reason we really wanted to create a syndrome rather than just one symptom is that I think people forget that the estrogen deficiency really affects the entire GU tract for women, not just vulva vagina. Uh, and also the nice thing about having this syndrome is it's important to realize uh, the symptoms have to be bothersome for a woman to have the diagnosis. So, you know, you might be doing an exam and see, you know, a, a vagina vulva that look um, atrophic. And yet when you speak to the woman, she says, I have absolutely no symptoms. And so we really don't want to be saying that woman has a condition that has to be treated if she's having no symptoms. So I think the GSM syndrome is a really important uh new or not so new anymore uh, diagnosis because women can have some or all of the symptoms and they have to be bothersome to have the syndrome. I think one of the challenges is, is communicating to women that this often will appear later in menopause. If they don't recognize that it's estrogen deficiency, they think that it's aging, their hot flashes may have abated, and therefore they don't come forward with the symptoms. How many women typically, I, everyone's going to have estrogen deficiency, and experience some changes, but how many women are actually symptomatic requiring some type of intervention? Marla, it's a really excellent point. So many women, when we start talking about the syndrome, will say, but I thought I was done with menopause, right? <laughs> Hot flashes are over. And so what I really try to tell women is that the good news is for most women, the hot flashes will get better with time, but they need to be prepared. The genital urinary symptoms will usually get worse. Uh, and so we think that at least 50% of all menopausal women um, experience GSM. And sadly, probably fewer than 10% of those women are really effectively treated. And it really is not just the woman alone who is suffering with this if she's partnered. Talk about the impact on intimacy, relationships, quality of life that we often don't think to ask about. There are really a lot of very uh, good studies. We have to thank some wonderful investigators who are now at the IMS and uh, Dr. Kinsberg for doing some really large international studies to try to assess the impact of GSM on women's quality of life and sexuality. And it, it is one of the major reasons that women are distressed about their sex life and have low libido. Uh, we think it's the reason that about one third of menopausal women actually stop having sex altogether. Uh, what I see in my practice is a lot of couples stop having intercourse, which they might've found really pleasurable. And again, this is if we're talking about heterosexual couples and they switch to non-intercourse sexual activities that may not be as pleasurable for that couple. And they often really miss um, having intercourse in the relationship uh, when partners are asked about what the impact of these symptoms are, they will really say that they 
have a major impact on the relationship. I think it's also really important to remember that GSM affects non-sexual symptoms as well. I mean, often a clinician will have a woman in their office and maybe she's not sexually active and they don't even ask about symptoms. And that's a real miss. Uh, I have women tell me that they uh, literally stop going out on some social activities because it's so uncomfortable. It may be a reason why they're not on the web trying to find a new partner. Um, and as far as daily activities, I have women who say they stopped gardening. They stopped wearing some of their favorite pants because they were tight and uncomfortable. Um, they stopped riding the Peloton or riding a horse. So we do have to remember that this can be a really troublesome syndrome, uh, even for women beyond sexual activity. So let's talk about treatment because here often there is that whole lumping together that women still look at headline news or worried about the notion of estrogen. And here, you know, we have a whole world of options that are safe and effective for almost everybody um, without too many contraindications. So let's talk about those options. First, briefly about moisturizers and lubricants, but I really want to talk about the difference between them versus the type of treatment we can offer. Terrific. So often most women really will start with non-hormonal over-the-counter lubricants and moisturizers. Um, they're easy to access. A lot of them are not that expensive. And the way to think about it is that um, lubricants are really designed to be used during any form of penetrative sexual activity. They reduce friction. There are a lot of different formulations available. I take typically encourage my patients to try different brands, see which one they, and if they're partnered, their partner uh, find pleasurable and effective. Uh, some really good data from Dr. Panay and other uh, people very involved in the IMS show that we really want to encourage women to choose products that are kind of bio- essential, meaning they have the same pH and osmolality as natural vaginal secretions. I do typically remind women not to get products that are scented or zippy or zesty. Those tend to have a lot of chemicals that can be uncomfortable for the postmenopausal vagina. Uh, and then the moisturizers are a category of products that a lot of people aren't aware they're out there and they're really effective. These are designed to be used in the vagina on a regular basis, not specifically related to sexual activity. I typically encourage women to use them, you know, two or three times a week, often in the morning. So as they walk around, they kind of line and coat the vagina. And I just remind women, most women are moisturizing their face or their legs daily, and they have to remember that uh, the vagina needs moisture as well. So for a lot of women just beginning who don't really want to even see a clinician and get a prescription, uh, lubricants and moisturizers will really do the trick. Um, often for some women, though, over time, those are not enough. And that's when we really want women to know there are a lot of options. Typically, the mainstay of treatment for GSM beyond lubricants and moisturizers now is low-dose vaginal estrogen therapy. Incredibly safe. And so I don't know what the labeling is in Europe. Unfortunately, here in the United States, the drug label for microdose estradiol in the vagina that does not raise blood levels is exactly the same as the label for systemic doses of estrogen by patch or pill that raise blood levels and effectively treat hot flashes. So even though these products, you know, we're talking four to 10 micrograms of estradiol right. in vagina and no significant increase in um, serum blood levels compared to the menopausal range. And yet women have to read a package insert that says they're going to have a heart attack and a stroke and dementia and breast cancer. And so a lot of women won't use these really effective products because they're appropriately frightened. So I think it's really important, especially in the United States. And again, I, it'd be interesting to talk about the labeling in Canada and in other countries to let women know they'll see that package insert, but it's actually not relevant to the really low doses they'll be They'll and be. I think it raises a, another critical, critical point that when we talk about systemic hormones, we talk about the window of opportunity. But when we're talking about vaginal estrogen, that doesn't apply, that you can start this at any time when one needs to have treatment for her vagina. So often the symptoms are right. later. Yeah. So we really want to make that distinction. So Absolutely. not only can you start later, but we want to let women know they, I often say to women, look, 
you are welcome to continue these products forever. <laughs> and uh, I said, even if in the future you may not be sexually active, you may still find that they're beneficial in terms of activities of daily life. And I didn't mention before recurrent urine tract infections. Right. There are double blind randomized trials that the low dose vaginal estrogen therapy reduces recurrent UTIs in postmenopausal women. And then a couple of new players to the treatment, um, looking at DHES and a spamifene. A word about those. Terrific. So another very effective and again, very safe product because it's vaginal and minimally absorbed is a very low dose of DHEA. It is uh, FDA approved to be used daily in the vagina. I have a lot. Of, first of all, it can be expensive. I have a lot of women who find that gets a little messy. And there are some kind of clinical experience data that, you know, just two or three times a week may be enough for some women. Again, should be used in the morning often so that walking around will help um, spread the product and very effective, again, very safe, minimally absorbed. A spemophene is yes. an oral selective estrogen receptor modulator that's also government approved for the treatment of officially it's BVA, but it would be uh, that's what the FDA approval for all of these drugs are for. But of course, it is for GSM. And again, effective. A lot of I know in my practice, at least a lot of my patients really don't want to take a daily oral systemic medication for a local problem, but it is still a great option and available, uh, although it is not FDA approved to reduce the risk of breast cancer, as most of our SERMs are. You know, there are certainly some data that it uh, reduces breast density, so it may be a great option for someone who's pretty concerned about breast cancer risk, but also has a GSM and, and like it has no concerns about taking a daily systemic medication. I want to okay. point out that here it doesn't make a difference if you have a uterus or if you don't have a uterus, the treatment is going to be the same. That's right. And uh, that's also another really important point, Marla. A lot of people ask, you know, do you need progestogen when you're using only low-dose vaginal estrogen? And the, the simple answer is no. Uh, these are incredibly low doses of estrogen used directly in the vagina, minimally absorbed. On the other hand, the safety data for low-dose vaginal estrogen therapy in terms of endometrial cancer uh, and endometrial biopsies is a, is a one-year study. So mm -hmm. I always just say uh, we should be reminding all of our patients, whether they're on low-dose vaginal estrogen therapy or not, they need to report any postmenopausal bleeding, right. even spotting, even if it's after sexual activity. So I think as long as women know that, and their clinicians take it seriously, you know, whether you evaluate with ultrasound first and then biopsy or hysteroscopy or hycosis, uh, as long as women report bleeding and it's evaluated, uh, there's really no need for systemic progestogens. You know, if you have a patient with a very high BMI, you're concerned she's at risk for endometrial hyperplasia, even without the low-dose vaginal estrogen therapy, you know, could you give her 14 days of a progestogen systemically once or twice a year? Of course you could, but that is mm -hmm. not um, required. So, and let's make a point about women who are on systemic therapy for vasomotor instability, yet still have symptoms of vaginal dryness. So the concurrent use of whatever they're using for their hot flashes and night sweats, and there's a plethora of therapy in that area. Can you add on vaginal estrogen a word about reassurance there? Well, another excellent question. It's really important not to assume that just because your patient is on adequate doses of systemic estrogen therapy to treat her vasomotor symptoms, that she has complete relief of her GSM, her vaginal symptoms. So really important to ask. And there are you know, many women who really benefit from both systemic estrogens to treat hot flashes and then low-dose vaginal estrogen therapy to treat GSM. And they can be used concurrently, again, because the low-dose estrogen products are minimally absorbed, won't increase blood levels really compared to what they already are with the systemic therapy. So I don't think we'll ever see a large randomized clinical trial for our women with breast cancer. But for many of them who, you know, and, and we can't lump them all together because it depends on their cancer if they have metastatic disease. But generally, you know, people will just say, no, you can't use any vaginal estrogen in this population. And despite the fact that we don't have large RCTs, a word on these women who often feel completely abandoned. 
incredibly important point to raise. Um, and as we know, these are women who are really high risk for GSM. They've often gone through early menopause. They're often on anti-estrogen therapies and can be incredibly symptomatic. And, you know, we see women who are so glad to be done with that horrible, miserable year of surgery, chemo, radiation, and then they try to attempt to get their life back on track with their partners and are really distressed when it's sometimes impossible, so uncomfortable. So typically with patients with a history of breast cancer, I do start with the non-hormonal. So lots of lubricants with sexual activity, uh, vaginal moisturizers on a regular basis. And this is a good time to, to remind us all that pelvic physical therapy can be incredibly effective for this, mm -hmm. uh, for this condition. Often what happens is that women have changes in the lining of the vagina and vulva, the epithelium that responds really well to low dose estrogen and other treatments, but then they've also developed provoked pelvic floor hypertonus as a secondary to the discomfort. And mm -hmm. so unless you then treat the pelvic floor, you know, the vagina can look great and yet she's still having terrible distress with any attempt at penetration. So I'll often have these women um, go to pelvic PT and then see them back. And if they say, you know what, still really uncomfortable, I'll check in with their oncologist, but in general feel really comfortable with low dose vaginal estrogen therapy uh, because it is minimally absorbed. Now, the one group of women where I still remain concerned uh, are our patients who are on aromatase inhibitors with a history of breast cancer. <laughs> of course, the goal of those treatments are to make the normal menopausal low estrogen level almost undetectable. So right. even though the low-dose vaginal estrogen therapy products won't raise the blood level above normal for menopause, it will no longer be undetectable. So I think, again, most of our oncologists are still pretty comfortable. And, and for so many of our patients, if they just use low-dose vaginal estrogens three or six months, get everything back on track, become active again, they may actually be able to then stop and do okay with lubricants and moisturizers. Um, there, there are no data that the low-dose right. vaginal DHEA is safer in women on AIs. But because, of course, the androgen and the, the DHEA will not be converted to estrogen be, when the aromatase inhibitor is on board, it's a nice option for those patients. So whether it's actually safer, sometimes it just makes us all feel a little bit better. But the uh, women with breast cancer are, are, remain very good candidates for low-dose vaginal estrogen therapy when it's needed and you know when you've checked in with their oncologist. So one last question before I let you go. The notion of lasers, and um, we see advertisements for things like vaginal rejuvenation that generally get my back up. Um, but when we think about laser as a non-hormonal approach for women who suffer the symptoms of GSM, a commentary on that. I'm so glad you brought that up, Marla. We actually had an, um, initiated an NIH-funded, you know, randomized control trial of laser versus sham laser, mm -hmm. and because the preliminary data looked good, the uncontrolled studies where there's no sham, meaning the women get laser treatment versus essentially no treatment, or sometimes even vaginal estrogens or lubricants and moisturizers looked really good. Um, the theory behind laser, someone might say, why in the world would burning the vagina make things better? It's very similar to what's done on the face. Uh, you know, it's a, a fractionated laser where there's lots of teeny, teeny little um, areas of injury to the epithelium that then heal. And the theory is that the healing is then um, kind of rejuvenating or makes everything better. And it sounds great. And there are some data for the facial laser that it really does make a difference. Mm -hmm. So uh, we were really waiting for a sham control trial because we know everything gets better, you know, with placebo and right. a, a really high quality study out of Australia. And then some subsequent studies have all shown that essentially vaginal laser is no more effective whether you turn on the laser or you just make it buzz and make a lot of noise. So these are incredibly expensive treatments. Yes. They're usually not covered by insurance and there are risks. There are risks to true burns and other injuries. So I would really discourage women from using this treatment for their symptoms. Um, I know there's still some clinicians, you know, once you've bought the laser, it's really expensive. It's hard to convince yourself that it is not an effective treatment because women often do feel better. But again, the placebo control trials were pretty definitive. So I would discourage use of laser at this time. 
Well, I think we've reviewed an extensive amount of information. I think there are a lot of options that are out there for women. And one of the takeaway points is talk about it, talk about it, talk about it, because women will assume since this is later on that it's just part of aging and there's nothing to do. So nothing like an informed clinician and an informed patient to really offer the best care to our postmenopausal women. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks so much, Marla.